Do's and don'ts, not effective. How to regulate foreign tourists then? And will the LRT go underground? And a crackdown on investor visas? Stay tuned for details. Welcome to the latest news from Bali and Indonesia. This is September 27, 2021, and my name is Bruce. Selamat siang. Another lovely day. Dry, though. No rain. The temperature, 29.4 degrees Celsius. Humidity, 64%, and wind speed, 14.7 kilometers per hour. And I hope the weather is nice wherever you are. And we need a little rain to get rid of this drought. Okay, let's get right into it. Do's and don'ts. Bali is ineffective Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy. Open if there are other ways to regulate foreign tourists. So the Deputy for Marketing at the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy, Nima De Ayu Martini, responded to the statement by the head of the regional office of the Bali Ministry of Law and Human Rights, who stated that the do and don'ts were not effective for foreign tourists. She said Bali is popular everywhere, and Bali is going to remain popular and attractive to people who want to visit. So, with so many tourists, the government, including Bali, has issued a ruler mechanism, so now there are do's and don'ts of what tourists can and cannot do. Of course, we all know that, although they don't seem to be being passed out at the airport. Previously, it was reported on national television that the regional head of the regional office considered that the do's and don'ts were ineffective in stopping the behavior of naughty foreigners. Marathini said, if do's and don'ts are not effective for foreign tourists in Bali, the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy is open to other proposals to prevent bad behavior from foreign tourists in Bali. Socialization via social media through travel agents, all stakeholders, we want that to be done because what's being done is very basic, she said. It cannot be denied that sometimes tourists don't know this either, so that all parties involved must continue to carry out socialization. Previously, the phenomenon of foreign nationals, aka foreigners acting up in Bali, has been discovered, really. And even though the do's and don'ts have been implemented and socialized, well, however, <laughs> the head of Bali Tourism Service said that this is not because supervision is lax. He said, we always do this. Just because they're being badly behaved does not mean that we're watching out, that we're not watching out. He said, this doesn't mean that the task force isn't working. We always have incidents and we always act on them. According to him, because the socialization of do's and don'ts was delivered to the foreigners before going to Bali, if there are still incidents of foreigners acting up, it means that they don't understand. That means you don't understand. And so they're going to need to be reminded again. So it's not because these rules aren't being handed out. Are they being handed out? Has anybody gotten any? I haven't heard of anybody so far. Maybe somebody has. If you've gotten your booklet of do's and don'ts, please leave a comment and let us know. Otherwise, I don't know. Maybe they don't know because they haven't been informed. And he said, one of the problems is climbing the mountains. Now, you go back, what, back when Pac Coaster was governor, he said he was going to put a ban on this, but people kept going up, and it was supposedly going to be implemented later. Now it says several different articles, not just this one, but uh, several other ones, that you're not allowed to climb mountains. But as far as I know, people are still climbing the mountains. Has anybody climbed a mountain recently, or has anybody been refused to go up into the mountains? So, Pak Pamayan said, even though Pak Koster is no longer the governor, the regional regulation is still in effect. Responding to this, Marthini said that her party would follow the Bali provincial government regulation regarding the prohibition on climbing mountains in Bali. She said, we are following the Bali provincial government. But what is clear is that this must have a purpose. We respect this. We are waiting for it to be opened, of course, with security considerations in mind, and this is for sanctity. If it's open, we'll promote it. But if not, we will respect the rules. We're still waiting to hear from the provincial government. So, I don't know. More confusion about this? At the same time, 
Bach Pamayun said that the ban on mountain climbing for tourism is still being implemented at this time. He said, we still maintain that in accordance with the direction that the mountain is a holy place, we will continue to follow Pak Coaster's policy. He said, this is all still being studied. According to him, the ban on climbing mountains in Bali has had no impact on tourism, but information will be provided on various activities that can be carried out on the mountains, such as reforestation, research, or cleaning up the mountains. He said, the point is, you can't climb yet. After the levy on foreign tourists entering Bali takes effect, the plan is that the funds will be focused on waste management in Bali. I'm going to talk about this in another segment in just a minute. The levy for foreign tourists is set at 150,000 rupees or the equivalent of 10 U.S. dollars. Of course, that changes because it goes up and down. Directions from the president for the acting governor is to focus on two things, main, managing waste while maintaining cultural customs so that the results are real. Focus on completing this because tourists see that waste in Bali is a problem. No kidding. He said the waste problem was just a direction and the program would be discussed. So once the funds come in and an activity program will be created after they get the money, there is no sense in making a plan before they get the money because, well, what's the point of planning ahead? Pak Pamayun said that the target for obtaining funds depends on the number of foreign tourists entering Bali. He said if this year, 2023, there's 4.5 million people, just multiply that by 150,000. But it's not just simple because there are exceptions. For example, airline crews and tourists, domestic tourists. So not everybody is paying for this. He said the allocation of income from the tourist levy will take place when the money is collected. And then, as I said, the program will be created after that with objectives for the regional regulation, which is considered to be beneficial for Bali and tourists. The tourism office will take the lead in collecting the money and putting it safely in the state treasury. According to him, payments will be made at Nuarai Airport and Banoa Harbor. After paying via visa on arrival, foreign tourists will immediately make the payment using the Love Bali application and after making the payment, they will immediately get digital proof. It's said that the benefits of this levy are for the implementation of culture-based quality and dignified tourism government, then for the management of customs, traditions, arts and culture, and local wisdom. Furthermore, for cleanliness, order, comfort, and security while in Bali. So if they're looking at 4.5 million international tourists times 10, Dollars. Let's use dollars for a minute here because easier to multiply than 150,000. Well, you're looking at how much money? 45 million dollars? Okay, they're going to use this to clean up the island. They're going to use the per preserve culture. I don't know. We'll just have to see how that works out. Let's take a look at another segment on this. Levy of 150,000 rupees for foreign tourists socialized. The Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy together with the Bali Provincial Tourism Office, had a socialization of the levies for its foreign tourists. The socialization was carried out at the tourism office on Jalan Legian. The socialization follows plans to implement the regional regulation in February 2024. The socialization was attended by a number of organizations, PHRI, ASITA, Bali Hotel Association, and others. During this outreach, the tourism industry supported the implementation of levy for foreign tourists. This is because the levy aims to protect the customs, art, and cultural traditions and local wisdom of the Balinese people. Then the glorification and maintenance of Bali culture and natural environment, as well as providing quality of services and organizing Bali tourism. So they got a lot of things that they're going to do with this, I guess. The head of Bali Tourism Service, Pak Pamayun, again, said that they would focus on programs to use the funds from the levy when it's collected. He said, we'll discuss it later because the funds that come in, well, then a program will be created for the objectives of the regional regulation, and one of them will be protecting the natural environment. Meanwhile, the deputy for marketing at the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy, Ibu Marthini, who I talked about, said that... The Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy certainly supports the levy on foreign tourists. 
This is why the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy is socializing this well, because they want to make tourism in Bali sustainable, cultured, and dignified. Mm. So remember, February 2024, you're going to be paying a little more to come to Bali. And what about the LRT, right? I've talked about traffic the other day. And well, there have been some interesting comments made on that video about, well, horror stories about how long people have been sitting in traffic. And what about the LRT, the light rail transit that I talked about? Uh, now, two, two, two different things. Now, one article came out yesterday, and so I got that, and I was going through that and getting that prepared. And then another article came out this morning, mm, kind of hesitating. So, underground LRT is a solution to traffic jams in Bali. The budget from Kuta to Nuarai is set at $5 trillion. The proposed LRT is going to be built underground, according to this. However, building it underground is going to take a lot of money. It's estimated that construction underground will cost three times as much as if it's on ground. The Deputy for Facilities and Infrastructure at the National Planning Agency, Bapinas, said that the construction of LRT in Bali is facing some big problems. First, because in Bali there's a rule that buildings cannot be built higher than a coconut tree. Is that still being followed? I know a lot of buildings way taller than coconut trees. Secondly, we cannot widen the road because there's many temples in Bali. That's why the only way must be downwards. And downwards to fund is going to cost three times as much as above. He said, it's going to be very expensive, even though there's only 4.9 kilometers between the airport and Kuta. Previously, the Minister of Transportation, Budi Karya Sumadi, said that currently preparations are being made for a feasibility study for the construction of the Bali LRT. The feasibility study will be funded through an aid scheme from the official development assistance from South Korea. Thank you, South Korea. So, according to this article, which I saw yesterday, the day before yesterday, I'm going to go underground. Now, new thing out today, the head of Bali Provincial Transportation Service responded to the option of building an underground light rail transit in Bali. When contacted, Pak Samsi said that not all of the LRT will be built underground. He said that's an option. We have the option to build underground, but not for the whole thing. So if there is part that can be over the, on the surface, we'll do it on the surface because it's cheaper. He also said that actually the LRT is part of an airport train that is going to go to Mengui. So he said phase 1A reaches Semenyak, then it's split again to carry out phase 1A and phase 1B. Phase 1A is to central parking. 1B is to central parking in Semenyak. Phase 2 will be from Changu to Mengui. <sighs> the addition of these lane phases will be processed one by one. Underground, overground, <sighs> we may get LRT in Bali sometime. Maybe not while I'm still on this planet. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, and I mentioned that I was going to say something about investor visas. So there's been investor visas that have been changed. There's some new regs out, a new situation, how much you have to pay for that. And I'm not going to go into that now because I just saw it this morning. And, well, as I've said before in a previous video, I'm not really a person for the investor visa thing. But what the government is doing is they're going to crack down on some of these investor visas, well, a lot of them, that were given out, kind of like given out candy back during the pandemic. And so there's going to be an existing PTPMA check. For some existing companies who have not fulfilled the required obligations, the Investment Coordinating Board, BKPM, is addressing the issue of virtual addresses that people are using and asking for the realization of the $10 billion in capital. A letter has gone out to these companies and <laughs> telling them what's happening. And I'll just summarize the letter here. So this went out to all these companies, and there was a, a list of companies, a lot of them, many using the same address, right? Basically a virtual address. And so this is going out, this letter has gone out to company directors. 
It's based on the results of monitoring business licensing data in the online single submission system, also known as the OSS, and field visits. It's known that your company is still using virtual addresses, correspondent addresses, especially for business activity addresses, and has not yet realized the investment value plans. In according with applicable regulations, we ask you to immediately submit another address where your place of business is in Bali and make changes to the company data in the OSS system within 30 days of receipt of this letter. If this is not fulfilled, you're going to lose your business license. Immediately realize the minimum investment of 10 billion rupees, excluding land and buildings, included in the two investment activity reports. If the minimum investment value requirements are not met by the given time limit without any significant investment realization, greater than 50% of the total plan value, we are going to revoke your license. We convey this for your attention. And so people that are here that got investor visas and, well, they didn't really have any plan on investing anything, and they set up a virtual address with some agent, they're going to have to pony up, A, get an office, get some staff, make sure that they have the 10 billion rupees that they can show because they're going to be asked to prove that they've got 10 billion rupees or they're going to lose their business license and, well, that means they're going to be out of the country as well. So if you're planning on getting an investor visa, make sure that you use a reputable agent, a reputable company here because, well... There are some that are said not to be quite so reputable. And on to the lift tragedy. Ayutthaya Resort owner and elevator mechanic become suspects in the deadly lift case that killed five employees in early September. Both were proven responsible and guilty for this work accident, which resulted in death. It was found that there was an element of negligence and there is a possibility of a sentence of five years in prison. The owner... Vincent Juono was charged with Article 359 of the Criminal Code. And the contractor, the mechanic, is also subject to Article 359 of the Criminal Code. However, the Guyanier police have not yet detained these two people. Not yet detained, they said. On Friday, we sent a summons to the two suspects. According to a Guyanier police spokesperson, the two suspects <laughs> weren't aware that they'd been named. <laughs> Wow, sometimes things happen here that I don't know. It's hard to believe. The police chief confirmed that even though the suspects had not been detained, the Ganyar police are still alert to the suspects' movements so that they do not escape. They know that they are here in Bali right now. Apart from these two suspects, the chief said that there could be new suspects. He said even if we've already got two, it doesn't rule out the possibility that there will be other suspects in the future. A lot of the evidence was confiscated by the police, including the, the rope, the cable uh, that was 3.85 meters long. And there was a woman owner who was talked about many times in the early articles, and she was kind of the face of all this. And there were questions, why wasn't she named a suspect? Apparently, the business is in her husband's name, not her name, and so he is the one who is being held legally responsible at this point. She is not. And so continue to follow up on this and see what happens. So that is it for today. Thanks for viewing. Be kind to someone today. Stay safe. And I will see you next time.